I believe that storytelling has the power to transform our lives in the most fascinating and unexpected ways. Over my career as a journalist and social entrepreneur, I met individuals whose passion and values are making this world a better place. I am Elizabeth Filippouli, and I invite you to hear the stories of some amazing, inspirational people. You have a very impressive background as an entrepreneur. And that started quite a few years ago at a very young age. I would like to ask you, how did it all begin? My journey in entrepreneurship um, and business started at a young age. My interest in traveling, in understanding other cultures and trying to generate money came from as young as eight or nine years old. I was fortunate enough to be able to have seen a lot of the world because of my father's job, not because he was paid well, but because he traveled a lot and he used to get free tickets for me to go along with him. So I'd seen uh, some amazing countries like Japan, Australia, been all over the US and Europe uh, and Asia because of my father's um, profession. And I was able to understand a lot about other cultures and realize how different the world is and how much opportunity there is out there. So my imagination and my ears became pricked at a very young age to, to learn more, understand more. And over the years, I, I've built a strong affinity to seeing opportunities and trying to understand how I could capitalize on those opportunities. And I went to a, school where I was certainly the poorest kid but there was a lot of wealthy uh, children and parents around and I saw them as an opportunity as potential customers and having one experience where a parent said to me of a friend oh you go to Japan quite a lot with your dad could you bring me back a mini disc player and these were just about coming onto the market in the UK but had been available in Japan for, for some time and I brought back this mini disc player and sold it at a profit for 50 pounds I must have been 10 years old and that's when I realized that there's things that I see there's opportunities that I have there's access to markets that others don't and there is a demand and quite quickly uh, I, 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 I scoured my brains and my, my, my thoughts were not inside school books, they were outside the school, school walls, in fact, and I wanted to be part of a much bigger and wider world. And you know, other things that drove me to really think about business and entrepreneurship at such a young age was getting on these long haul flights at eight or nine years old was when there was no TVs on planes. It was a overhead projector. And there was one movie to watch. Uh, and if you didn't like it, you got on and read a book. Now, being short and not being able to see over the, the seats in front of me, I used to stand up on the seats and have the headphones on trying to watch these terrible quality movies from 30 rows back. And at the time, you were also able to go and visit the pilot. And as a child traveling on his own on these flights, I would often get approached by the air stewardesses saying, do you want to come and see the cockpit? And I'd walk up to the cockpit and quite quickly discovered that as you get to the pointy end of the plane, there's people in beds with their own TVs. And this was just shocking to me that I'd been spending all this time standing up at the back of the plane trying to watch TV. And there were uh, men and women lying down at the front with their own TVs. And I got off this flight after about 11 hours uh, to Tokyo. And I said to my dad, why am I stuck at the back of the plane? And there's people up the front with TVs. What is that all about? And he said, well, they're businessmen, son, and uh, they work hard and they study hard. And one day, uh, do your degree, get your grades, and you might have a job to sit up the front at the pointy end of the plane. And I thought, forget that. I'm not waiting 20, 30, 40 years to be able to lie down and watch TV. I want that now. I grew a huge fascination with that individual. So my, my, mod, my role model was not a footballer or a cricketer or a basketball player. Uh, necessarily. My role model was the man in the suit, uh, well-dressed with the briefcase, uh, turning left when he got onto the plane, as opposed to myself turning right. So that really 
inspired me to understand the world of business and entrepreneurship. And, you know, fast forwards to two or three years to the age of 11 or 12, I started building websites and had a website called wickedbydom.com and I had a website, Scooters UK. And we're talking over 20 years, 25 years ago. Um, and the only reason I was able to afford a computer at the age of 11 is when I was born, uh, family and grandparents had put some money into a savings account. And my dad said to me when I turned 10 or 11, he said, look, you've got some money here. What would you like to do? I said, I'd like a computer. And uh, bought a computer and got online with what back then was called CompuServe. And it was a 14.4 KBS dial-up modem. So you weren't able to uh, download much or upload a website of any major significance, but it connected me to the world. It connected me to the, the companies in Japan, the shops in Japan I've been buying mini displays from. It connected me to uh, forward-thinking retailers in the US. This is before Amazon, this is before Google. So it wasn't a case of typing it in and it pops up. You had to spend hours trawling very complex forums and, and, and chat uh, sites to find out what was what in the world. But it also gave me an opportunity to present myself as a business leader at the age of about 12, um, because although the internet is a very dangerous place, and I must say there are a lot of people out there pretending online and offline to be someone they're not, I was able to use it to my advantage because uh, not many 12 year olds had the internet and were emailing companies in the US and Japan trying to do business buying their products. And quite frankly, if I turned up at their stores, they would have kicked me out. But the fact they were getting an email from Dominic McVeigh, the CEO of wickedbydom.com, it seemed like an opportunity for them to start selling. And I quickly uh, developed a taste for online retail and was seeking out products and at the same time, I also became quite interested in uh, the stocks and shares. I used to read the FT. You know, I wanted to be reading what those businessmen and uh, women were reading at the front of the plane in uh, their beds with TVs. So I started reading the, uh, the stock markets. And one day I bought the Financial Times and a business card fell out and it said Charles Schwab Europe. And I thought it was actually Charles Schwab's business card. I now know that Charles Schwab was the company and it wasn't his business card. And I managed to get my dad's credit card and sign up for a, a share trading account. And it just, you know, I was crazy. I was trying to do anything and everything to, to live that life in, in business at the age of 12. I didn't want to wait and I wasn't interested in school. And it, my dad soon found out that I was using his credit card. So like anyone with tenacity, I tried to find out how I could get my own, despite people telling me you have to be 18 for a, a credit card in, in England. And I started looking for Visa and I stumbled across Visa Motors, which is a fold up motorized scooter brand, loved the products, was convinced I could sell it. Once again, started hitting the company up being Dominic McVeigh, the CEO of wickedbydom.com and Scooters UK, all these different company names I was inventing. And I tried to get this uh, Visa brand to send me a scooter for free. I said, look, if you give me one for free, I can certainly sell them. And they said, look, if you buy five, we'll give you one for free and you'll make profit on the five that you sell. And after about six to eight months of trying to flog five, sell five before I even had them, I, I was able to get enough money together to, to place the order. Six scooters turned up, one for me, five that I'd sold and a bit of profit. And I, you know, that was from my bedroom in East London. And two years later, uh, Visa had developed more products, Razor scooters were available, and I was involved with the sale of almost 7 million scooters, maybe more worldwide, over the period of about two years, between the ages of, I'm going to say 12 and 14, 15, from my bedroom. <laughs> Crazy story in such a short space of time. I often don't talk about it. I don't necessarily reflect on it, but it is nuts, and that uh, seems like a lifetime ago. So, curiosity, ambition, what else was it that triggered this success or the journey towards success, which, as I understand, was very much, you know, about status, perhaps, but also I would like you to tell us which year are we talking about? So give us the picture of what was going on in that particular year. You mentioned there was, you know, it was before Amazon, so of course it was before 
online sales or online sales were just nascent at the time? Words that come to mind for a young entrepreneur is certainly tenacity, um, fearless. You don't have anything to lose when you're 10, 11, 12 years old. Uh, you don't have a mortgage to pay. You don't have gas bills. You don't have electricity bills. Taxes don't exist. And confidence comes with that. The fact that you know you can, the consequences are, are minimal to none. So that element of risk taking is, is not really risk taking as we know it as we get older. Um, you know, I see young uh, boys and girls jumping off rocks uh, that are two, three meters high at the beach. And I'm, I'm, I'm like scared for them. But I know if I was eight, nine or 10, I'd be the first up there jumping off those rocks. And that's a, that's a very pure, pure thing to, to harness. Uh, at a young age and we often encourage young people to explore themselves as much as possible but we don't necessarily encourage young people to explore setting up a business my mum was very good at supporting me in my ideas she knew I was crazy she knew I once I got a bee in my bonnet I wouldn't let it go it was an expression she often said so if I was determined to achieve something or do something it was easier for her i think her life was less stress-free if she just let me crack on and either fail or uh, and hopefully learn and maybe succeed uh, and not come home with a broken arm or leg it wasn't as if i wanted to be a bmx rider or um, uh, an alpine skier i wanted to sell products i wanted to sell products to parents of friends at school and I wanted to fly business class and I wanted to uh, eventually have my own business from a very, very young age. And I didn't want to wait around. I didn't want to, 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 to hang on for 20 years. And when you see an opportunity, and of course a young man at the age of 10, 11 or 12 doesn't necessarily have intuition, but if you can simplify it to feel that if you, want that product if you believe that opportunity is right for you if you feel that you would part with your pocket money or your hard-earned cash uh, for something in particular then i think from a young age you can start to get a grasp of um, a, an instinct of course it doesn't come with wisdom or experience but at a young age it shouldn't come with risk and failure should not be seen as a negative it should only be seen as a positive at a young age um, as an older individual, I'm far more risk averse. Um, I feel that I've moved into a phase of responsibility as opposed to entrepreneurship. But at a young age, you, 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 you really must harness and experience and explore as much of your thoughts as possible. And, and in business, uh, don't worry if you don't have, have uh, the, the track record. Uh, most of the successful business leaders don't. Dominique, they say that entrepreneurship can be a lonely journey, especially when someone is a self-made entrepreneur. And so from what I hear, it was a kid which was very creative, it was, you know, hungry to learn, to understand, and to get involved in business without really back then understanding exactly what, what business is about or how they can do that. So a kid which was very different, I would assume, to its classmates. How did it feel? And also how did that loneliness, if it existed back then, did it continue over the next years, the years of success, the years of financial ascent? From a young age, um, a lot of people didn't necessarily understand what I wanted to do or achieve. They didn't understand how a 12 or 13 year old had a business, could want a business, even understood uh, numbers, mortgages, borrowing, import, export. And that meant that there wasn't a huge amount in common uh, with my peer group. And entrepreneurs of all ages, whether in their teenage years or their retirement years, are hugely dedicated and committed and most importantly passionate about the businesses they're trying to, to, to grow. And I think that often creates a, a, um, an element of uh, reclusiveness. You'll, you, you'll turn down dinner opportunities, you'll turn down uh, play dates with friends, you'll try and bunk off school. I, I did bunk off school to go to meetings in the city. Um, 
I tried to get out of PE and sports so I could uh, make phone calls and I would fake sick notes so I could go and sit in the matron's uh, room and, and try and say I need to call my mum to get medicine and actually I'm calling a supplier or a customer. Um, so you know, it, it, it is a life of uh, solitude in that sense because all your friends at school want to play football or want to play computer games at a weekend um, and I wanted to sell scooters, I wanted to sell products. And that hasn't really changed. Uh, a vision and a mission is, is often in one person's head. The skill that I hope I've developed over the years is sharing visions and inspiring other people to believe in those visions and have their own visions as well to help grow the business, the, the charity, the, the, the opportunity, uh, and to excel as individuals and as a team. But I spent the last seven years growing an organization to almost $200 million in revenue with 15,000 employees. And most of that time was spent in hotel rooms in countries where I had no family or friends. Um, I used to spend 200 nights a year on a plane, uh, long haul flights. So it, it, it was something I became very much used to from a young age of uh, developing a business on one's own. And then, you know, being on the road, it, it is tough, but you're, you're comforted by your faults, you're comforted by your achievements and your passion cuts it all out. It's, you're, you're committed, very committed to make, make your businesses work. And you, most people that are successful will not let anything get in their way. You mentioned before that there is no such thing as failure, especially for a kid. But I wonder if this idea, and perhaps I'm taking it for myself and my own journey, and because my parents also were always very encouraging and you know prompting me to do things, to to utilize my talent, my energy, and never taking you know the word failure as a word to be included in my dictionary. So I'm with you that uh, failure is nothing else other than a lesson, other than as a step you know, to move forward, to do something else or do something better. How did you experience failure if you had any setbacks? And because this masterclass is very much about learning from you, can you give us some examples of what we, someone would call failures or setbacks and how you handled them? That's a tough one. Uh, Elizabeth, <laughs> because I'm sure there's lots I've failed at, but I just don't see it as failure. I see every brick wall as something to be broken down and, or, or ideally jump over it and leave it in place and keep the competition uh, having to keep hacking away at it to break through. It's, look, things do go wrong and it's part and parcel of running a business or being self-employed. And it, it's important to make sure that frustration, fear, stress does not get the better of you. It's important that um, should one uh, path or journey not be where it is expected, and that is often the case, uh, we do not necessarily end up where we expect to go. We have to be adaptive and flexible. We have to understand that change is a constant. We have to appreciate that uh, the best of society has often experienced the worst. And it's how we bounce back. It's how we um, leapfrog, stayed and um, failed ex uh, experiences. It's how we jump, jump forwards that we need to think about. I'm trying to think of personal experiences in, in that respect. But I often find that I identify other people's failures better than my own and try to help them succeed or failures of government where individuals have been failed, where companies have failed their employees, where uh, organizations or institutions have failed the ones that they need to protect. I often find that uh, I, I will lean towards those to make sure that the wrongs are done right and that individuals are protected and that society can move forwards because I'm not necessarily always looking out for myself. When I was younger, I used to do far too much. I used to think I could do anything and everything. And I, I think when you're 16 and you've had a lot of success, you do get an element of confidence, maybe precociousness um, or arrogance, which I like to think has um, faded with age. But 
you know, in my younger years, after being successful, I found possibly that I was trying to do too much. And I've learned today that focus is key. And then you can be much more uh, Hawkeye on the issues at hand and you can be prepared. I feel that when things go wrong, you, you see them way in advance. I, I certainly sense that I can predict or anticipate the issues. Um, I can't always navigate around them. Sometimes they're inevitable. And I think a lot of my undoing has often been impacted by market forces, politicians, consumer trends, banks, you know, to some degree issues that are out of my hand. Um, and that's why it's important that we, we, we have to work towards a goal, but often deal with the reality. And you will find that your goals are often met without realizing it. And you'll look back and you'll say, hey, wait a minute, I achieved X, Y, and Z, and I achieved it a year ago. So I, I, I try to encourage people not to live in the goal. Don't spend the money before you've got it. Don't live in a world where you think your organization is having this impact. Deal with the reality, focus on what is key today, and keep, uh, and that will naturally push you forwards. And the goals will always evolve. My goal at 12 years old was to fly business class. My goal at 20 was to have a private jet. My goal at 35 is to get on a plane as little as possible. So it's, uh, the, the goals keep moving, uh, rest assured. And the, the meaning and purpose will often change. You said before that you didn't like school. And uh, I'm wondering why you didn't like school and then did you do any studies which helped you with uh, your ventures, you, you becoming such a successful entrepreneur? How did, how did it work? I'm not a conformist and I'm not a huge fan of institutions. Um, and at a young age, I felt that my school was trying to put me in a box, was trying to mold me. Uh, cookie cutter uh, comes to mind. And the school was very much focused on people achieving grades so that they would go to university. And I remember there was a, a, a scoreboard at the school for how many people each year got into Oxford or Cambridge. And I often used to look up at that and I knew that I would never be going to Oxford or Cambridge. Formal education was not going to be for me. That said, I think when I was 17, I spoke at Oxford University for the Entrepreneurship Society. And I've also spoken at, at Cambridge um, University and, and, and a number of others from a very young age. And I haven't adapted or you know, invested in formal education. I'm a huge fan of education. And I, I, I believe if you want to be a doctor, you've got to get those grades. I don't want a doctor that's learned in the school of life. I want a doctor that's learned at Oxford or Cambridge. I don't, don't want an engineer that has, um, you know, been tinkering around with aeroplanes in his back garden. I want someone that has studied at the finest engineering schools, tinkering around with the planes that I get on. Um, but for me, it was, I, I work at such a pace and a speed that I find that school often slowed down my thoughts. It often slowed down my learning. And I focus a lot of my time reading journals, um, evidence-based papers. I, I spend a lot of time reading, you know, reports by think tanks, institutions, uh, various agencies within the United Nations, statistics, data. And I'm very well read in a number of subjects and topics, but not educated. Uh, I've tried to explore the world, connect with people and individuals, first-hand experiences. So I'm not a man of theory, I'm a man of practice. And education requires a certain formal education requires a cert certain element of theory that is something i'm not conformed to but getting out into the world learning and now i i i'm a, an active contributor to research to papers to studies that have taken place by some of the world's most eminent institutions um, from the united nations right through to uh, universities throughout the globe um, so i don't think it is always necessary to to have that formal structure, but it is all an individual's uh, perspective. I think one will know from a young age um, if they're comfortable 
with uh, academia and what that means to them and what they want to achieve in life. And this is where we talk about setting those goals. If you want to be a doctor, you need to get your head in those biology and chemistry books. You need to also develop compassion towards human beings and, and being able to, to relate to individuals and you need to study. You've got to get those, uh, those grades, get those goals and start working in the medical profession. But if you want to be um, uh, a traveler and you want to be someone that is entrepreneurial and looking for ideas, you've got to get out into the world. You've got to meet people, meet businesses, go to conferences, sign up to webinars. You have to understand cultures and you have to understand change and adaptation and you need to move quickly and fast. And that's where you, we set the goals and deal with the reality. You want to be a doctor, deal with the reality, get the grades. You want to be an entrepreneur, set the goal, deal with the reality, get out there, understand, try and read as much as possible about your market, about your product. And when you have some money, employ people that are far better than you, that, that do have the grades to do your accounts, to do your engineering, to do your computer sciences. Um, so it's it for me I learned that at a very young age that I was not good at everything that, but I did have an ability to have a vision to inspire and to translate that to other people were you reading books how was your relationship with um, a reading about stories biographies or following people who had been are very successful entrepreneurs and so their life's journey has been an inspiring, inspiring one, one to emulate. Did you have such, I mean, I know you mentioned before that your role model when you were nine or 10 was the business class traveler, but as you were evolving as an individual and as you were, I'm sure, getting more inspired by the world that you were coming across and by the potential that was out there, which coupled with your passion and, and your ambition, would create what created out of you and, and your ventures. Were there any individuals, men or women or organizations that you were like, oh my God, this is an amazing life. This is an amazing project or venture. And I want to create something not similar in, you know, the, uh, in approach, but similar perhaps in its reach and success. I have to confess, I've never read um, a biography and I've never been one to try to emulate or, or copy others. I've tried to learn from as many people as possible, um, as many cultures and societies and really form my own uh, path through life. It's very humbling though to be able to go to communities in Ethiopia, in Kenya, in Uganda, in countries I've worked in or uh, lived in or, or volunteered in to understand the needs of others and understand what I can do to, to help them. They've been the biggest inspiration. Those less fortunate, those that have been victims of sexual violence, uh, domestic abuse, those that have been victims to, to war, to uh, famine, to climate change and understanding what I can do to change their lives. That has often been, in my later years, the driving force for me to want to have a more successful business so that I can do more for communities and others. I'd like to think that I've been a, a leader and a shining beacon in that sense in parts of the world which are often forgotten about or poorly reported on or misrepresented. That's been a, a challenge for me personally to be able to spend time here in London in such a beautiful uh, environment where we, we have so many privileges to then get on a plane and seven hours later be in a community where people are struggling for food and water, medicine, uh, access to shelter, jobs. Um, it, it, it's crazy. and. I wouldn't, that is what sits in the back of my mind every day. How can I get out there to, 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 to help more? And the young men and women that I meet in refugee camps, if they had the skills and the resources, these would be the, the leaders of today. The, the challenges that they've been through, uh, the environments that they've had to su survive in, the abuse 
uh, that they've, they've had to endure. And now to live in conditions which are quite frankly scary to even consider. I know that if they had the right access to technology, the right access to information, the right access to education, they would be the Bill Gates of the future. They would be the Bill Gates of today. Um, what they have had to do, and that is what really inspires me, know, uh, knowing that these individuals of what they've been through and what they, that they, they can achieve with the right support. It's never, I've never really tried to emulate an individual. I've really just tried to discover my own path and, and find elements of inspiration along the way. So a young boy, which, which within how many, 16 years, 17 years, he manages to build a company which is now a 200 million pound company, right? Who helped you with some practical if you like matters, like, for example, your branding, like, for example, your marketing, like, for example, um, the markets that you would go to. Did you create an advisory board? Did you surround yourself with people who were, are successful experts, successful professionals themselves, and they became not only your sounding board, which is very important, but also the people who provided you with, with expertise, of course, I'm sure that you have the departments of marketing department for so and so, as you mentioned before, it is about hiring talent. But before then, I would like us to take a step before you start, you know, uh, making money enough to buy, I'm sorry, to buy, to, to hire uh, top talent. Before then, who was there with you, for you, to help you with your very important uh, things like your marketing, your branding, investments. How did you receive investments? Look, it's very important to connect with as many individuals with you know, as many industries as possible and find those sounding boards. Uh, it's not about taking people's time, it's about inspiring each other. And I've often found that those that are older than me um, often have the best advice. Um, and are more willing to share. And it's important to find individuals in your community, in, um, within family, which you can look up to, which you can have respect for, of which you can bounce ideas off of. I often reach out to people today, knowing that I'm in a fortunate position and always say, look, let me know how I can help. And, and I think that is because so many people reached out to me as a young man asking how can I help, how can I support you, how can I be part of your visions, how can I be part of your, your, your goals. And that is, is, is a very um, important rela relationships that you have to build. And as you start down the path of creating an organisation, you have to identify individuals. Talent is key. Um, talent is going to be crucial to developing uh, your business. But it, also how you treat talent, how you treat your colleagues, um, the environment that you want to, to harness. Sometimes I see uh, entrepreneurs of all ages and backgrounds can be quite authoritarian. They want to be uh, over controlling within every detail of the business from what toilet cleaners used in the office to uh, what accountant they're going to be working with. You, know, you have to empower people to make those decisions. Of course, there has to be boundaries and barriers of what they can and can't do. But you don't hire an excellent accountant to then tell him how to do his job. You don't hire an excellent um, office manager to tell her or him or her how to do their job. You, you set the vision, you, set, you put in the KPIs, you empower those individuals and you make it possible for them to deliver your goals. You're not going to deliver their goals for you. Only they can do it. So if you have hired the world's best forensic scientist and you're interested in biotech, don't start telling them how to do their job. It's not your place to be. And that's, I think, some of the best advice that I've received from peers is always have told me to to hire the best individuals, empower them, uh, and monitor and refine the programs, you know, the roles as they go forwards. 
it, it, it's it's a it's a fallacy if you are planning on hiring people and then telling them how to do their jobs or what software they should be using. It's, it doesn't work like that. You mentioned before about Ethiopia, about the projects that you work with currently, which are projects of social impact. They are about empowering local communities, and we know, of course, the, the challenges that uh, people in various parts of Africa and other parts of developing countries uh, are, are suffering on a daily basis from access to education, from lack of access to the digital world, something that you and I have the privilege to enjoy and you know, do this conversation today and we take it as a given, but it's not the case and very, very often they, there are people out there who do not have access to clean water. So uh, the projects that you uh, have your hands on and you work with, uh, we would love to learn from these. I was recently at the World Economic Forum in Davos and I was sitting on a panel with the Deputy Prime Minister to Ethiopia. In the audience there were a number of business leaders, other heads of state, uh, heads of global agencies uh, within the United Nations and, and, and other institutions. And there was some what I would call aggravated investors in the room or frustrated investors who were challenging the Deputy Prime Minister on some of the commitments Ethiopia had made to investments that uh, were still in works and, and, sa and sadly uh, were, were delayed, which happens with governments and countries all over the world, from the richest to the poorest. And the Deputy Prime Minister, you know, uh, being the, the fantastic diplomat he is, uh, uh, appeased the audience um, or the, the couple of investors who had some agitations around Ethiopia. But I felt it was important that I stepped forwards and made quite clear my feelings on their frustrations towards the Deputy Prime Minister and Ethiopia. We have to remember this is a country which has been through severe famine and is still one of the poorest countries in the world. I said quite openly and very bluntly that should one wish to come and do business in Ethiopia, the goal is not to get on the plane turn up and go to the local fancy hotel, sign contracts and get on the plane back. It's their fault for not understanding the issues on the ground. It's their fault for not doing their due diligence. It's their fault for not getting to the communities, seeing the projects and assessing for themselves what position Ethiopia is in to commit to investors or not. And this really resonated with the DPM and, and a lot of the, the majority of the audience turned and looked at these investors, you know, quite starkly to say, too right, you've got to get off your backside, you've got to get out of the corporate bubble and you've got to get into the communities. One of the things that I did when I first uh, started working in Ethiopia, I spent time with my, my local team and I said, look, I, I want to know what charities you have here. I want to know who's operating here. And that was because I was thinking about how I could team up with the charities to to engage uh, the work that we're doing and see if we could uh, provide jobs for some of the people that they're helping. And one of the gentlemen in the HR team said there's a, there's a safe house in town, which ho ha is home to about 300 individuals. I said, well, I want to go there. And he said, I wouldn't recommend it. It's, it, it's, it's, it's not pleasant. It might not be uh, a safe environment for you. I don't think it's a good idea. I said, look, if I'm going to be working in this community, I want to understand the challenges that this community face. So we start heading out of the, the facility in, this, in the factory and we're going uh, to this safe house. My colleague was driving us there and I said, I don't want to go to the hotel. I thought we are going to the safe house. He says, no, 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 this is the way. We turned down the road. I said, that's the hotel, he said. That's the safe house. Next door to the hotel where I was staying, there was a Mother Teresa sanctuary. And I've knocked on the door and gone in. And there's must be 50 or 60 men uh, lying around who are victims or sufferers of tuberculosis. Um, and then further down, there's children in the most squalid of conditions, undressed. 
um, respiratory, visibly uh, suffering from respiratory conditions. Uh, and probably, you know, a hundred plus women uh, trying to look after the kids and uh, sitting around talking. And I started uh, a conversation with the lady that was running the, the safe house. She spoke very good English. She was originally from India, uh, had been living in Ethiopia for 25 years. And we started talking. She told me that most of the women that were there were uh, victims of rape, uh, sexual violence, domestic violence. Um, a number of teenagers, 14, 15, 16 years old. And most of the children were born uh, or conceived, should I say, through rape. And these women were in the safe house because what was happening was they would be a domestic help, for example, and then be raped by a man in the house. Um, go back to their communities. Uh, the community was would blame the woman and said, you're not bringing in any money. What have you done? And then six months later, they can tell she's pregnant and it's a scorn on the village. So they kicked them out. Some of these girls had traveled two, 300 miles, no food, no water, you know, little access to it, certainly. Um, not in healthy conditions. And I, I, I started spending time at this safe house. And one day I was there, um, a, a woman had just given birth and she tried to crush the skull of uh, now this might be we might be getting a bit too too deep here uh, Elizabeth so I feel happy to cut it out but I want to tell you the story anyway now she tried to crush the skull of the baby whilst uh, during labor because she didn't want the baby and she thought it was she was impregnated by the devil um, that baby survived but a second woman that same day uh, who had given birth about three days earlier tried to drown the baby in oil and I actually have a picture of it so I was just so shocked and we had to rescue this baby and, 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 and shake it around to get the oil out of his lungs. And I said, look, we need to stop this. We've got to break the cycle and we need to give hope back to these women in these communities and that they can embrace the lives that they've been, uh, that they've been given to care for. So I was able to, uh, to take a number of women uh, from the safe house and put them in jobs. Uh, put them into soft skills training, so how to uh, take care of oneself, sexual health education, um, how to uh, use a, a, a toilet with a flush, how to turn a tap on, how to turn a tap off. So uh, uh, why you shouldn't touch a, a light switch uh, when your hands are wet. Basic training for safety, a uh, number of soft skills. You have to remember a number of these women have never been living in an environment or working in an environment with electricity. Um, so a number of soft skills and from day one, from day one, those girls, those ladies were getting paid. Um, within three or four weeks, they would often um, start uh, on the job training and within two to three months, they were on the lines, the, the, the manufacturing lines, earning an income. I went back about six months later and spent time with a, a young uh, girl who uh, had a child that was about nine months old by then. And that child, of course, uh, given this situation, was conceived through rape. And I said to her, how things are going? Uh, what, what's, what's happening here? What can I do for you? And it was a very emotional conversation. She broke down in tears. So did I. And she said, I've got my life back. I, I have a home. Uh, I have a future for my child. I have a future for myself. And before I thought my life was gone, today I know my life is back. And that's the, the key and the power to to learning about the communities that you work in um, and, and the inspiration that actually some may see going to a region and building a factory as, um, you know, not a positive thing for the community, but actually building that factory in the way that we've done it has saved lives. It's saved the lives of children. It's saved the lives of women. It's given hope, um, you know, suicide, uh, no doubt is an issue. It has put people back on the path to dignity. Um, and the CEOs that stood up at Davos and complained that Ethiopia is not doing enough. My complaint is that they are not doing enough. They're not doing enough for the communities they're working in. They're not doing enough to understand, to learn. And, and my, 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 my key takeaway from this story for any individual is that 
businesses have to be led with compassion and empathy. And as you invest in new communities, you, you go there to learn, you don't go there to teach. And you quickly learn what you can do for them. And together you can create a community uh, which is, has, has goals to develop, goals to, to change and goals to empower. And it is important that, to understand that the only way you can do that is by seeking out the most vulnerable. If you leave the most vulnerable behind, you have not done a service to that community and that community will continue to suffer and people continue to suffer in that community. And that that's, was one of the biggest learnings that I've had in my journey over, over the recent years. And it's one that I push back on individuals all the time and always challenge them. And if anyone asks you why you're trying to do good, the first thing you need to ask is why they're asking you why you're trying to do good and why they're not doing good themselves. So ultimately doing good is good business. It is a very powerful story, that one that you shared, uh, Dominic, and uh, so many things to, to learn from such a story and from such a journey and so the way that you handle things. I guess someone who um, is still, you know, at an early stage of, of entrepreneurship and they want to do good, they want to create a venture that will have a social character, that will have social impact. But they may say, okay, I'm too small, I'm, I'm, I don't have the capital. What would you say, what would be your advice to those, regardless of age, younger, older, you know, an aspiring social entrepreneur could be from any background at any age. What would you say to them? How does someone start? I think a good, if you're looking to start a business with meaning, I think you need to align yourself with a purpose. It's, you can't do everything at once. You can't please all the people all the time. And a good guidance, I think, is the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And I think it's important that people uh, find an SDG that connects with them, whether it's uh, uh, reducing inequality, whether it is clean oceans, whether it is industrialization and growth of economies. Find an SDG. But don't just go for, say, SDG number eight. Dig into the SDGs and look at SDG number 8.2. Get into more specifics, particularly when you're starting out. Really refine what your business good is going to be. From there, you will find there is a lot of communities that support those SDGs. There's a lot of investors. There's a lot of impact funds in that space. Um, and there is also a lot of opportunity. These 17 SDGs have been put forwards to get people thinking. It is a, there are, they are spaces which planet and society is lacking in. Uh, they are challenges which are facing us all. And we need minds, young minds, experienced minds, minds of all backgrounds to come forwards and think about the SDGs and what they can do. It doesn't always take money to make a difference. Um, often your time uh, and your commitment and your advocacy, be an advocate for that SDG, be an advocate for the change that you want. Your voice will be listened to and your, your role in society uh, will become more eminent and you will start to meet more people that share the same views. You'll meet institutions, investors that want to back your views um, and you'll be able to talk about why your business can overcome a challenge, why your business can do good for planet and society. And having those conversations, I think, is a really good way to generate momentum. It might not generate the cash on day one, but it will generate your ideas. It will also do good without having money, just by having those conversations, making little changes, pushing others to think differently. You'll do good without even putting a pound or a dollar through your, through your uh, PayPal account. So start thinking what those conversations can be. Learn about the SDGs. I think if you go to un.com, or it might be UN.org, you will be able to uh, link through to the SDGs. Learn about what businesses are interested in. Uh, look at the UN Global Compact. Um, try and see what is being done in that space and what they're encouraging signatories to do. Uh, is there a gap for you in that space to support the signatories to those compacts? Innovation is key at the moment. Um, think about your cost to market. It doesn't have to cost a lot to develop a product. There are platforms out there where people will support your ideas. Kickstarter, for example. Um, think about technologies that can bring your cost down. If you're into the space of designing products, 
manufacturing is a very old fashioned industry and they're very long in their tooth and set in their ways and it's expensive. Look for disruptive technologies that can help you bring products to market quicker. Um, it's not about finding a factory that can make a million pairs of underwear a day or 10,000 bicycles a week. Find those guys that can do two or three really unique products in, in, in a week or a month and what that technology could look like for you and your products. Um, you don't always have to sell a lot of something to make a lot of money. You could sell a little of something to make a lot of money. Uh, think of uh, car companies like Bugatti, although I'd like you to think about electric car companies before you think about car companies creating uh, more CO2. And that's where the SDGs fall into this. How can you make that positive impact? What does it look like? And how can you find resources which are uh, new, innovative and can support your goals? Everyone with a good idea wants to talk, so get talking. Um, people, that's the best way of marketing, having conversations. Dominique, we, are, uh, have, we have experienced uh, a reality which perhaps we never expected that we would uh, go through in our lifetime. As you know, of course, if you ask Bill Gates, he will say that I have tried to warn you for years now, guys. So that coronavirus crisis and how it has transformed the way we work, the way we think, the way we handle life, the way we handle personal safety, hygiene, it's an entirely new world. And of course, along with the stress and frustration and that threat, that invisible threat out there, there is also creativity. There are opportunities, there are things happening which are great things because in a way it's like we have, we have been given the opportunity to rediscover ourselves, to rediscover our societies or how we uh, conduct ourselves within relationships, how we conduct business, how to become more accountable, more compassionate. What are your takeaways from this crisis so far and how do you see the opportunities which are looming? as uh, you know, entrepreneurial opportunities or as other opportunities on a human level? The coronavirus crisis has caused a lot of us to think. And also, I think it's caused a lot of us to realise there's so much that we can go without. We don't need to be consuming uh, so many T-shirts a week. We don't need to be buying new dresses and new shoes as regularly as we need to. Um, I think people have discovered and harnessed and uh, have been forced to discover cooking at home. You know, I've got friends that hadn't cooked at home since they were at college or university. Um, and, you know, 20 years later, they've been eating out at restaurants or having deliveries or microwave meals their whole lives and are now, you know, considered uh, pretty good chefs. Um, people are spending time in their gardens. We're talking to family more. We're, we're reaching out and connecting to make sure that we've got each other's backs. Um, we're paying far more respect to industries which uh, were kind of forgotten about or taken for granted. Uh, we're realizing that every human being has a role to play in, in keeping society moving. And in fact, those on the, the lower paid jobs are the ones that have really kept things happening during coronavirus. And I'd like to think that uh, more respect will be afforded to, to individuals that we've often just seen as a delivery driver or a pick and packer and we actually see them as, as, as a person, as part of society, as someone that has helped get us through coronavirus. And as part of this, we're also seeing the acceleration of uh, financial and business models uh, come to the end of their life cycles. Uh, you know, online retail has jumped up. We've seen individuals that never bought online now buying online and preferring to buy online. As the lockdowns ease, there is not going to be the rush to uh, physical retail that uh, I think governments and retailers are hoping for. I think we'll see a, a, a huge reduction in what people spend on the high streets here in the UK and elsewhere. Uh, I think we will see a huge um, uh, Align, uh, realignment of how people spend their time and money. Um, I think we, we will certainly see people looking to buy a house with a garden as opposed to having a, uh, a flat in London. So you'll see you know, garden stores and outdoor furniture will no doubt be doing very well at the moment. Um, but, you know, is a party dress on the list? No. And are there going to be lots of parties to look forward to? Sorry, guys, I don't think there are going to be many for the foreseeable future. 
and even if there was, I don't think uh, people are, are, are of the mind to be going out partying three or four times a week or, uh, you know, several events. I think we've really learned our rhythm at home with community, with family. And I think we'll look to be focused more on larger social events, maybe five or six times a year as opposed to five, six times a month. Um, connecting with nature is, is, is big on people's lists. So what can an entrepreneur that's been sitting at home be looking at? They need to be looking at the essentials. What is going to be required? Well, underwear, probably. Socks, maybe. Fruit and vegetables. How can we make food more efficient? How can we reduce waste? How can we improve the quality? Um, what have you found that has been difficult at home? What online service do you wish existed whilst you've been locked down? These are some of the things that people should be thinking about to, to look for the opportunities. Travel is changed forever. Um, I know a lot of people are looking forward to getting on planes this summer to, to Greece and uh, uh, south of France and Spain, but the fact is there's not as many planes flying. Uh, the airlines have fired tens and tens of thousands of people. So even if we all want to jump on a flight to the Greek islands, um, and even if we've got the money to do it, given the circumstances a lot of us uh, are now in, there's not many planes going, right? So we, we're going to have to be much more uh, open to domestic holidays, particularly in Britain. In Europe, that's, you know, the French holiday in France often, the Germans holiday in Germany, Italians, why would you leave Italy, right? Um, but I think Britain has always uh, been, been a nation of, of travellers. I think we're now looking to explore our, our home shores even more, and we'll see a lot of that. Um, but I know people from all over the world will be, be listening to this conversation. And you, you've got to understand that things have changed, that business cycles have finally come to their end in certain industries. Um, in some cases, I know it's very sad we've lost jobs, but thankfully these businesses have been put out of their misery. You know, give the new guys, new girls on the block the chance to step up and, and fill those spaces um, because there's been too many organisations on life support. And I think that shedding will give chance to, to, to new uh, entrepreneurs, new business ideas to come through. My final question is about uh, your legacy. Of course, you're too young, perhaps, to think about a legacy. You are too young to think about that. But at the same time, you have been someone who was, I think, very mature from a very, very young age. You um, set a goal, you set your targets, you set your ambitions, and then you pursued your dream and you made it a reality. And so someone who operates like that as an individual and someone who is such uh, a focused social impact leader, I believe would know what they would want to remember, to be remembered as. So what is Dominique McVeigh's hope as to the legacy that he would leave behind and what does he want to be remembered as? Well, I'm hoping I'm going to be here for some time to come. You can't get rid of me yet. Life, life begins at 40, I'm told, and I'm 35. So I would like people to learn and to see what I've done and, and try and do some good themselves. I'd like to think that if Dom can do it, anyone can do it. If Dom can do good in a pretty tough environment, why can't I do good in a good environment and then actually do good in a, in a tough environment as well. I, I'd like to think that I'm, I'm learning as I go and it would be selfish of me to not share those experiences, to not share what I've seen, to not share what I've done. The learnings and the mistakes are crucial. Why should others fail? It, it's not something I would relish. I want others to succeed. Um, you know, we, I live by the saying, we, we rise by lifting others. And we have to support all and everyone in community and society. I would like at some point during my life to actually be able to build centres of hope. Um, I would like to, in the UK, work with uh, homeless and disadvantaged young men and women and, and try and build them 
build their skills, build their confidence, build their ability to be business leaders themselves, and also build them up into a position where they can pay it forwards too, where they can give back to the to society, um, and really help them think about the most disadvantaged, not just in the UK, but, but globally. We're citizens of the globe. We're, um, and some live by the saying that charity starts at home, but ultimately charity starts where we have touch points, where we're, we're able to influence, where we're able to change, um, whether it be around a dinner table and we're advocating for someone, or whether it be in a rural community in, in Kenya where we're trying to save a life. Uh, we, we have to advocate for positive change at, at every stage. And I would like to make sure that everyone feels empowered and feels that they're in a position where they can demand good uh, and demonstrate good. Just because something is legal doesn't mean it is right. And we really need to think about what that means for us, what it means for our employees, what it means for our employer. And we need to think what it may look like in 20 years time. Let's start thinking ahead. Let's start thinking just because something's legal today doesn't mean it's right and how we can start changing it sooner.